So as we share in Scripture this morning from the Gospel, I'm going to be reading Matthew 4, 1 through 11. You know this is a very familiar Scripture. Then the Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness so that the devil might tempt him. After Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was starving. The tempter came to him and said, Since you are God's son, commend these stones to become bread. When Jesus replied, It is written, People won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. After that, the devil brought him to the holy city and stood him at the highest point of the temple. He said to him, since you are God's son, throw yourself down, for it is written, I will command my angels concerning you, and they will take uh, you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. Well, Jesus replied, again it's written, don't test the Lord your God. Then the devil brought him uh, to a very high mountain and, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said... I'll give you all these if you bow down and worship me. Jesus responded, Go away, Satan, because it's written, You will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil left him, and the angels came and took care of him. This is God's word for us, spoken today as the word of God. Thanks be to God. Well, as we begin this Lenten series, what can we learn about God? We're going to be looking today at the, the topic, Standing Firm. You know, as I've shared with you in one voice, we, we, we read this scripture, and, and it's, it's a most familiar scripture to us. And, and I realize reading from the Common English Bible, some of the things that you expect are, are just worded a little bit different, but it is, it's significant for us to see how we, we are understanding this whole idea of what it means to be completely in line with our understanding of God so that we may be able to stand firm when those times of trial and tribulation do come, and they will come. When you think about that, times of tribulation, times of temptation will come. Can be escaped. If Jesus was, was, uh, was uh, put in the position where he had to deal with uh, the alluring enticements, of the deceiver doesn't mean that we're not. He may have been able to say to him, get away from me, I'm done with you. You've, had th you've made three attempts, and I fooled them all. Just go on. We, on the other hand, you know what happens? We sometimes hear those alluring words, and sometimes, again, I say sometimes, we cave. Well, well, you know, it won't matter this time. Or, but what about, you know, I, 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 I'm always amazed at this whole idea of debating and how we're seeing debates unfold today. I mean, it's kind of sad. But debating and people arguing points and putting themselves in, in their, their, their position so staunchly that they cannot see the other in any way, shape, or form. It's an indictment against our culture. It's an indictment against who we are as the people of God. You know, as the people of God, we're, we're supposed to be able to speak in one voice. As the people of God, we're supposed to be able to make this declaration of our faith and be able to affirm it with our whole self, not just with words that are wrote, words that are, that are repeated easily because we've done it and we've always done it that way and we've always said it that way. That's why I want to change it up. No. Just because we've done something the same way doesn't mean that that's the pattern we have to follow all the time. But sometimes it's good to go back and be reminded that God is God and that God is in control. And so that when those times of trial and tribulation come, when those temptations kind of face us, we have the ability to be able to say, enough of this. We recognize who's really at work here and that is not the one who loves me the most, but the one that wants to destroy my soul. 
Well, Jesus helped us understand this when in his own wilderness temptation. You know, when, when he's, he's standing firm against what, what the devil is trying to do, you know, it, there, there were three pretty slick things that, uh, that the deceiver tried to, to put on him. First, he was tempted to use his divine power to manipulate basic needs. He had... He could do whatever. If he could, you know, we find out about Jesus, if he could heal the blind and cause the lame to walk, well, he could definitely look at a stone and say, become bread. That was the easy part. But it was the whole idea that he was being tempted to use his divine power to manipulate. Well, that's not the way of God. But the second temptation, it's even, it's even more slick because, because he's tempted to use his place as God's son as a way to manipulate the father. You know, that, that when he says, well, remember, you know, it says in the scripture, you know, it says in the, in the holy word that, that, that he, won't let the, he won't let you even dash your foot against the stone. You know, the angels will come and tell, go ahead, jump. It's like my cousins used to tell me, oh, my, my, my grandfather's garage wasn't very high, you know, maybe, maybe eight foot at the most, but, but that we'd climb up on there and say, go ahead, you jump. Guess what I did? I jumped. Jumped one too many times. After, you know, a twisted ankle and couldn't walk for a couple of weeks on it, I quit jumping off of the garage. You know, we learned, but, you know, it, it, was, it was one of those, you know, let's, let's manipulate the Father. Let's test this thing out. Let's see if he really will hold up to his word. You know, he said he would. Uh, how many times have we heard that? He said he would. Go ahead, jump. It'll be all right. <laughs> but then the third one. Oh, the third temptation. Jesus is tempted to deny the Father. The ultimate thing. Deny the Father so that he could be given all that the world had to offer. This is the Son of God. And the deceiver is saying to him, Go ahead. Just bow down and worship me. And I'll give you everything that you can see. Every, it's all yours. It wasn't his to give in the first place. But just go ahead. Deny the Father. That's what he really wanted to do. Deny God. Oh, folks. Let's not gloss over these words on the page. Let's look at them very critically. Let's understand that it is the deceiver's purpose to take us off track and to put us in line with his way of doing things rather than God's way of doing things. The deceiver wants us to step out of line with the teaching of the Holy Word. He wants us to tempt and to stretch the boundaries and test and see that God will really be there for us and then to ultimately go ahead and bend the knee to the one who wants to destroy the spirit. Hmm. That's a pretty, pretty, pretty slick way. Now, now it's my southern, you know, kind of out, but that, that's, a, that's a pretty slick trick. Jesus didn't fall prey to it. Question is, will we? Are we? When we face temptations, we learn something about God. Let's don't, let's don't forget that whenever there are temptations, we can learn something about God in those troubling times. God wants us to stand firm. God's desire is that we resist evil, that we resist injustice and that we push away all oppression in whatever form they present themselves. 
That's in our authority. That's in our power. That's in our ability to resist evil, to deny injustice, and to push back from oppression in whatever form it presents itself. Oh, church, we have a lot of work to do. We have a big challenge before us. We have big decisions to make. The question ultimately is, will we be the people of faith who are the faithful church? Will we be the faithful church? Uh, those times are going to come. Those times are going to come when, when the adversary will try to face us and try to face us off with Jesus. Even put us at adversity with Jesus. But think on this. The adversary wants us to abuse our authority. He wants us to test the Father by risky decisions, and he wants us to turn our backs on God and to chase after everything that is false and will fail. That's his agenda. Are we going to fall prey to that agenda? Are we going to stand back and just say, well, okay, well, that's all right. God won't mind. God's a forgiving God. God will let things go. God will say to me, hmm, I forgive you because I love you. Remember, forgiveness comes to those who ask. It's not a right. It's not a privilege. It's something that God freely bestows upon us, but we have to ask with a heart open to the power, to the powerful working of Jesus who died on the cross. But it's a must. We have to respond. How will we respond? Well, Won't you think about it in this way? We live in a time of obscured and distorted ideologies. What one sees as evil, another sees as acceptable behavior. Think about that. What one sees as an injustice, another sees as fairness and showing no partiality. And what one sees as oppression, well, another sees as a right and just act. We kind of live in a messed up world. But we have the authority, we have the power, we have the ability to be able to speak into those dark places and to say by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, we call these things for what they are, we call them sin. We don't deny it. We don't go to the Father and say, well, Father, you know, what do you think, God? You know, is that really a sin? You know, if, if you've got to go to God and, and ask God if, if God's opinion on something you've done of whether it is not right or not, guess what? A sin's a sin. <laughs> if it says 30 and you're doing 45, that's as much a sin as anything else. Huh. Now, wait a minute. It's not that serious. Now, right, preacher? Well, I'll leave it up to you to pray. But I want you to hear this scripture from 1 Corinthians 13, 12. It says this. Now we only see a dim likeness of things. It is as if we were seeing them in a foggy mirror. But someday we will see clearly. We will see face to face. God says, there's a reckoning day coming. There's a day when everything will be made right. All injustice, all trial, all temptation, all trouble will be made right. The question ultimately is, what side will we fall on? Because there's only two sides. Not the haves and the have-nots, but the forgiven and the unforgiven. So what do you think? What is your response? You have an opportunity to come to this table today and to be able to experience 
the overwhelming grace and forgiveness of a loving God. When you take the bread in your hand and you eat the bread and you drink from the cup, you are taking in a moment of holy and sacred trust. It is a mystery. I still scratch my head and wonder why did Jesus come and die for the likes of me? But the beauty is, I don't have to ask that question very long because it makes it very clear in the Scripture that Jesus came because he loves us. And our act of love in return is to surrender ourselves fully and completely to his divine authority in our lives, to trust in him to provide all that we need and to worship him as the God of all creation, the God he really is. So hear the word and respond, for this is the invitation that we have to come to the table, to surrender ourselves fully and completely to God in sacred trust, knowing that we have the opportunity to get it right. Amen and amen. Stand firm, folks.